Hello, Irish fans, and welcome to another edition of Dome and Domer. My name is Mike Brammer. Joining me tonight, Mike Coffey from NDNation.com. All right, Coffey, let's start with the B-roll. The real big obvious question is Notre Dame making a huge leap here in terms of some progression that we were hoping we were going to see with some improvement with this team, or is North Carolina just that bad defensively? It's it's hard to tell. I mean, I know their defense has been bad, but then again, their offense has been very good, and our defense shut them down. I think there's some I, – I was reading an article that the one running back from Cal who he held to like 33 yards suddenly blew up for like 250 or something uh, this past week. So, oh, I, wow. I, for, for, yeah, from a defensive perspective – I think there's a lot of evidence that the team is improving every week. And, you know, it's said that, you know, when you bring in a new defensive coordinator and a bunch of new coaches and they're trying to get the kind of get or get to know the scheme, stop thinking and start playing, it takes three or four weeks to for that to happen. And maybe I think we're seeing that, especially on the defensive side. On the offensive side, I think there's there's been more cohesion if you watch – how Drew Pine has played from that awful first half against Cal, but then the second half uh, against Cal, and then the two halves in North Carolina. I, I, I think we're seeing progress. I mean, I would have loved to see a game this Saturday so we could really see, hey, is it uh, – it's two points are a line, but three points are a trend. So uh, another game this weekend really would have helped along those lines, but I'm content to wait a week and let them put a few new wrinkles in for BYU. Yeah, I like that. Um, so I'm going to well, I can figure out how to pause this. Um, let me show you this because th there's some key points in the game that I thought were really, um, you know, good moments for us. And, and one of the big, more positive things going was what I thought I saw was some just great progression reads from Pine. So, you know, in this case, and I don't know about you, Coffee, but at this point, you know, we, we give up a score, we go three and out, and then we get the ball back, and I'm like, oh, my God, we're down seven. We just went three and out if we don't get this here. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and now this is, you know, further into that particular drive, but I just think that right here is a perfect example of Pine and his progression. So take a peek at this. I mean, obviously, going to Mayer, <laughs> which he figured out most of the game was going to be a, a great point. But I think it's great here if you if you you know if you kind of just if you look at this as he's coming back, and then this figures this is in the way. But you'll take us. I think he went through three progressions here. I mean, I, I honestly do. Really look like it. I mean, he, he yeah. He, I mean, if you, if you look, he looks to Diggs. He then looks to Lindsey, and then his third option is Mayer. Who's got man to man and and man, what an unbelievable, just perfect throw because it was a tight, tight window. Mm -hmm, I sure. mean, watch watch how tight this window is. I mean, you, that. Um, by the way, I mean, if you just want to know why Mayor is so damn good, I mean, look at this a tight end making this kind of move. I mean, I was like a little. Yeah. Like 31 starts to lean that way because it like, mm -hmm. totally looks like Mayer's going that way. And it was literally just enough to give him, you know, that, that that's open seam. But if you if you look, you can see, look at Pine and look where his head is. Mm -hmm. He's looking out to Diggs. He's looking to Lindsay. He sees the double on that. And he knows that I got man to man on. And obviously, 27 mm -hmm. is about his only worry, but he stays true. And look where that ball is. I mean, it's right where it needs to be. Because no chance for him Mayer to knock that down. Balls. It's not going to get picked. No. Nope. Mayor's either going to catch it or he's going to drop it or he's going to miss it. But yeah. You and Mayor really just, you know, bad things that can happen on a pass. Yeah. And I, and I think that, you know, you know, like you say, I mean, I, I, I think it's a combination of things. I mean, I think, I do think, unfortunately, UNC is not very good. I mean, I, no. you know, we, we took advantage of a very poor, defensive team but well, that's what you're that's what you're supposed to do though you that's right but you, but you do it and i a lot of points. And yeah we, we could easily have scored 52 points 
on this on this defense. Yeah, no, it's that, and um, and I also think that just the way the running game worked and the way that we got all three guys. You know, Diggs was banged up, didn't even play last week. He rushes for 50 yards, five yards a carry. Uh, Tyree was 80 yards, mm-hmm. more than five. I think he averaged seven. And then Estime obviously went wild with, you know, 134 or whatever he was at. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, and I think this is just another example of, a, of just a, a nice read by Pima. This is that touchdown. But if you see, he steps right into it. You know, he doesn't do what he normally does because Pine's been guilty of kind of throwing off his back foot, mm-hmm. kind of flinging it a little bit. But when when you look at this, you know, he makes the nice read. He does the the, the he's reading right here, mm-hmm. and then you just see him step into it. He doesn't back off. He steps right into it, mm-hmm. um, and obviously fakes fakes out the cameraman. <laughs> Well, in any event, just, you know, that I think was a huge point in the game. Mm -hmm. 7-7. He stands firm, follows through, and, um, you know, we get the flag on the lane. I'm kind of surprised, and and maybe you did my brain's not catching it, but I'm kind of surprised the UNC kid didn't get called for roughing. It would have been a crap call, but that that seems to be the way they're going these days. No, no, he did get get the flag. Uh, I'm sorry? Yeah, no, he he got the flag on this. Oh, okay, all right, he did. Yeah, no, he did. He got the flag. Okay. Um, I don't know because he went to the I head. I understand why they're doing that these days, but it, it does kind of you know mm, seems a little yeah. Tight. Yeah, I mean, it was definitely not a hard hit. It was just that he put his hands too close to his face, and, and the ball was cl- and, and well, and the ball was clearly gone. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 the the ball was gone. The kid stepped forward and pushed. And it's not like he was already moving in there when the ball was released, and you couldn't, you can't stop yourself in midair unless you're like right. or something. But no, that's you know, exactly right. You know, so I, I guess I can see why they would have flagged that, but it just seems like there's a lot of a lot of personal foul stuff that gets called these days that very different from back in the day. So well, you know, just yeah. and to your point, um, I mean, obviously, the, I don't know about you, but I I just went ballistic when they called that on Bertrand oh, after I, I saw. You know, you're watching it live and you're like, oh, my God, are you kidding me? And then you see the replay and you're like, whoa, wait a minute. And I thought for sure that was going to get overturned. Sure, absolutely. And and, and, and then I, lo I and behold. Like, if, if, if he had been if he hadn't been called for it last week, would the refs have let this go or are they looking to make a point? Yeah, I'll tell you what, I don't I don't like it at all. I thought it was an absolutely horrible call. No, I agree. And, and you know, there was not helmet to helmet. He didn't lead with the crown of his helmet to the helmet of the defensive player. It went where it should have been, which was below the head. <laughs> and absolutely. so, and, and, you know, it's just, it's, it's frustrating as all get out just because you got, here are our best linebackers now going to miss the, the first half of, and you know how it is. I mean, you, you can't just walk in at halftime and get into the game from the no. first snap, even though he did do it. I mean, he caused a fumble right on the first play of the second half. True. But, that is true. but you know, again, I just, man, that one just, I really struggled on that. Mm-hmm. But, you know, just um, on this, you can see where it just, he, he, so on this play, again, a couple things. One is, Obvious credit to Tommy Reese because this is something that they saw mm-hmm. in the game in the in the film the week before, right? Yeah, so I, I believe so. Yeah, I mean this is obvious, a perfect tip of the hat to Tommy Reese because this is something they saw, and man, what a great call this is! Being on the left hash like this, having Diggs, um, you know, in they couldn't have set this up any better than they did. I, I find and, it interesting that they. So if 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 you let the play go, they play action fake to him. You would think at least one defensive man would see him coming out of the backfield and say, because it it's not like he it's not like he immediately went to the right and didn't do anything with him. He faked to him. So you would think someone on the defense would look and say, oh yeah, here comes this guy. He may not have the ball, but I got to pay attention to him. Yeah. And they all just go the other way, which is, I mean, yeah, well, as you said. 
hats off to Tommy Reese for uh, no, it is. And I think it's something that he saw that was a breakdown in their coverage. Because if you look at this, you would think it's him, right? Mm-hmm. You would think that defensive end is rushing. He's not going to drop. I mean, he could drop, but he's obviously not. But if you look at the the uh, linebacker, these two are covered. His responsibility is this back out of the backfield. Sure. And he gets sucked in is what happens. So, you know, he sees it coming. See how he's leaning this way? But then all of a sudden, he you know, he turns on this guy and – Comple- and but I think this is just also, something that you also have Blake Fisher out there putting a block on him. Yeah, so, way out, which is a huge. Continue, it could be that if Fisher wasn't there engaging him, he yep. may have thought to to go past. Yeah. But yeah, because because he's like right right there. That's that's what makes a play, as you said. The, the yeah, the, look at the separation. I mean, it's and yeah, and this is one hundred percent Tommy Reese. No, no doubt yeah. about it. I mean, you can't. You can't say it's anything other than that. And, you know, I, I just – and Jeez, at the I point of the – Right. <laughs> at I the just, point of this – Again, that's uh, – no, no offense meant against, like, any of the players. That's, that, that, that was a big, a big, big play. And oh, huge. I, and the, the, the other thing, you know, we talked earlier about progress. I mean, I, I, I may have to rethink a lot of the things I said about – Tommy Reese earlier in the season. I mean, the beginning of the season to me, he looked overmatched. He looked like he was not able to implement what he wanted to implement. But definitely the Cowboys game, and certainly in this game, you saw yeah. flow. You saw uh, plays called based on things that they've seen or stuff that they saw earlier in the game. And I, I thought I read where that play was. They tried to run that play before, but he couldn't get the ball out there to him. When they ran it the second time, it was still just as open. He was able to get it out there. Yeah. Yeah, and I, you know, I uh, look at the end of the day. I think I, I personally think the next game will be the telltale sign for Tommy Reese. To be honest with you, mm-hmm. um, for for several reasons. One, he's got two weeks to prepare, and I think that's you always have to look at a coaching staff whenever they come off of a bye week because they they should have a have a huge advantage, right? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I mean, you you can't sit here and say that that's not a huge advantage. BYU's playing tonight at eight o'clock, so they can't you know practice for Notre Dame until tomorrow if they don't give them the day off, right? Mm-hmm. So Notre Dame has got two full weeks of preparing for BYU, and so I Ooh. I personally think that's that'll be the telltale sign for Tommy Reese in terms of where is he at with this football team. Mm-hmm. Um, just based on what we see next week. But so I, I did want to ask you this question because I'll be honest with you, Coffee, I didn't like this call. I was like, all right, guys, 31 14, you take the three points here and it's 34 14. You're forcing them to put up four scores to beat I, you. I, I, I agree with that, but even more so, if you're not going to kick the field goal, you're going empty backfield, four wide, on the three yard line. That yeah, that, that kind of a play call drives me up the wall. That that yeah, with with, with the like success that we had running, that used to just drive me crazy. It's like yeah, hey, what you want driving in fifth, worst case scenario, you get stopped on the two or the one. Bring your defense out there who's been kicking ass and taking names for m- most yeah. of the game and. But uh, it it just seems so. Uh, it seems so many bad things can happen. In a, yeah, and, it, and this is like this that. is kind of what I I kind of feel like is the progression of, uh, just you know having a first year coach who's yeah. young like he is. Mm-hmm. I mean, th- these are the kind of things you do. You're fired up. You're charged. You want to kind of believe in your players. You want to prove that you believe in them. But ultimately, at the end of the day, Freeman's got to realize that every single game is a microcosm Mm -hmm. and you have to make the right call at every point to give your team the best chance of winning. And I just don't know that it's in light of what we've seen throughout the season up to this point with our success rate on fourth down. (laughs) I just man, I was like scratching my head like, Mm -hmm. man, but, you know. When you, when you see this, it's, you know, if you look at the progressions, like, I, I don't know, to me, I'm always going to lean toward Mayer. Mm-hmm. And you've got one-on-one with Mayer. 
and you could easily read the cornerback to see if he stays with the wideout, which he does, mm-hmm. and then just watch Mayer with the move that he makes. I mean, look how much separation he gets right there. He does, yeah. And now, granted, you got man-to-man on Tyree. I get it, but but boy, you know, I don't blame North Carolina getting flagged for being pissed off about this call. I mean, I looked at the replay and I was like, yeah, yeah. I mean, it kind of was iffy. It was could have gone either way. I think. Well, the I, I don't believe the officiating was very strong in this game, but the thing no, is, it definitely was. Like by, it was bad. It's not like they were bad. They were just bad. I mean, they were they bad. bad on, on both sides, bad. they were just bad. Yeah. I saw an article that said one of, and I, I apologize. I should, should have reread it. Um, one of the refs who blew a call against Cal actually refed in this game or something. I, 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 I got to go back and read the article again. But, wow. Yeah, that's. Somebody, but the, the the officiating was not strong. If if Carolina is complaining, I understand why they are. But then again, you get calls like the ones for JD Bertrand and stuff like that. And yeah, uh, it was just kind of it was not a strong game by the officiating crew. But then again, it was an ACC crew. North Carolina was at home, so if they were bad, they were just bad. There's yeah. What are you gonna do? Totally. So, um, you know, I was kind of curious. So, Coffee, I, you know, I, I played high school football, and my sophomore year I played uh, defensive back. Mm-hmm. And, you know, this is back in 85. 80. Prehistory. Sure. Yeah, this is way back. But, you know, what's really interesting is back then, the way that they taught DBs was to maintain um, – a distance between the guy that you're guarding at an arm. So you had to be close enough to where your arm could be on him. Mm-hmm. But the second you went into the receiver's route, you would eventually turn back to the quarterback to read his mm-hmm. eyes. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Now, if your guy is going long for a deep throw, you would look into the receiver's eyes the entire time as you're chasing him. Mm-hmm. And the second you saw his eyeballs lift up, you knew the ball was in the air. Yep. And so you were taught to continue to, to speed, but then to turn your head so that you could see the ball coming in and, you, you know, play. make a play. So mm-hmm. take a look at this and see what you think. Yeah. I mean, was- look, look at where the ball – I mean, look at – right at this point – you know, he's reading the DB. He sees him. Saw him put his hand up. He's now looking at his eyes. Mm-hmm. And, you know, to and, and so what he does is he goes through, right? Mm-hmm. Now, today, what they do is they teach you um, to strip him. Like, don't turn your head. Wait till you see the ball comes into his hands. And then right at that point, reach in and knock the ball out. So, the, the, you know, today, that, that's how they teach. I, I think that, I mean, and again, I'll, I'll completely cop to never having played football. Um, I've read some, and I understand the, the, the philosophy you're talking about. I think with the speed and strength of wide receivers these days, trying to depend on someone to knock a ball free. Uh, that's tough. But, but then again, I mean, I know May is young, but he's, he's a great quarterback. I mean, I'm, Certainly. Oh, that was a hell of a ball. It's, it's underthrown. There's no doubt about it. I think this is our last game against North Carolina for a while because we're in yeah. that scheduled rotation that goes out through like 2036 or something. So it's going to be a yep. couple of years before we see them again. So if this is the only game we play against him, I'll be complete. I'll be very, very happy because he's he's. I think this kid's going to win some games before. Yeah, I, I guess what bugs me about it, the, the, the receiver was like planted and waiting for it and. I mean, you should be able to turn around and make a play on that. That's yeah. I just think that I mean, right there, you know how much you know how much room is left in the end zone. Mm-hmm. If he's right there, looking right into his eyes, and he can see that the ball is in the air, mm-hmm. and if he just turns with his and and raises his right hand, look where that ball ends up. I mean, well, right he, there he is all he's got. Or maybe even picks it off. He huh? even tips it, and it's out of stance. Now. Look, I'm I'm just a fan, so I'm not saying that <laughs> this is anything. I'm just I'm just pointing it out because I find it interesting because I, I even in the NFL, 
they've gone this route where, no, don't turn back to look for the ball. Fight through the hands of the receiver who receives it and knock it out that way. I got to believe they got some sort of statistics that proves that you have a better chance of that. But what, what's interesting is look at this play. And, and I think this is kind of interesting because this is that touchdown that we gave up. But But watch this. So yeah, he, he he does try to make a play on the ball. He does try and make a play on the ball. But the mistake he makes, Coffee, is he jumps too soon. Mm -hmm. If he takes one more step instead of jumping when he did, mm -hmm. he's right see there. How he just look at how much he just missed it. He might have even tipped it, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. But if he even takes one more step, he totally has it and knocks it, and that ball's no that that's not mm -hmm. a completion. Sure. Um, and so I don't fault him at all on this play. Now, you could say, okay, but if he would have stayed with the receiver and thought, thought through, but I don't know. Look look where the ball ends up that high. Mm -hmm. Is he really going to reach through and knock that ball out? Yeah, you know? the, the ball's on the outside away yeah. from the – I think May did the same thing that uh, Pine did on that – the play we were talking about to Mayer. He put the ball where either his guy's going to catch it or – He's going to drop it. It's going to be very, very. But, but you can see, like, I mean, it was a, it was a nicely thrown ball. Don't get me wrong, oh, but absolutely. boy, if that ball is even five inches shorter than what he threw, it gets tipped out of that. That's a non-completion. Yep. And so for me, I was like totally fine with this play. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, in any event, I you know, look, I think at the end of the day, the the big takeaways um, from this game, in terms of. The, especially the left side of the offensive line. I mean, Alt, holy cow, man, did those guys. That that Alton Patterson, I mean, wow. Now, it's, it's, again. It's amazing when you think that in that freshman class, Fisher was the one who was really getting all the attention. And ben Fisher right. played decently, especially when you consider how much time he missed with the injury last year and how far behind experience-wise he is from Alt. But and, and I would say all came out of nowhere, but he certainly wasn't getting the accolades that Fisher was, and he just has stepped in and played like a monster. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, look, and I th no way to shake it. I mean, we pretty much pounded them and pounded them hard. And, you know, we needed that, and Notre Dame needed that, and it couldn't have been a better moment. Um, but like all things, we're not perfect, and so there's a few things to point out that kind of make you scratch your head. Sure. Absolutely. And this is definitely one of them. And so, I mean, I, I I don't want to pick, but boy, this one you scratch your head in a big way. Yeah, he just get, just got. I mean, fourth and twenty one. Well, actually, it's right after this, so I didn't. I think I didn't cut this at the right point, but it's it's this play right here, fourth and twenty one. How do you let him get behind him? Like that? Like, <laughs> you give up a touchdown. I mean, I think there was just a little bit of confusion over who he had because you see, he's got the coverage at the beginning, and then he he sits on that curl like he figures, okay, there's somebody behind me. It's like, no, there's nobody behind you, and well, there is someone behind you, but he's not wearing the right uniform. That's yeah. Well, so you know, here's the thing. I, I mean, I just thought this was an unbelievable call on the defense. I mean, I loved it. In watching the replay, because if you look, I mean, if you look at this corner blitz, we have this entire package covered, okay? Mm -hmm. um, and that corner blitz was absolutely perfect because he's got outside, he's got inside, both of these guys go, which forces the tackle to pick him up, mm -hmm. and he comes free. But when he comes free, now again, I think it's just, college football he doesn't want to get flagged he doesn't want to do that but he actually beats it there but he takes like the outside angle and then doesn't make contact mm -hmm. i mean yeah. look right there he could have knocked the ball out of his hand if he reaches with his right hand right mm -hmm. there that ball never goes any further and instead yeah. he kind of wheels around it which gives him the opportunity to to, to then release the, the football really, yeah yeah I mean, he totally beat it. He could have even tackled him and not gotten flagged at all. Lower your mm -hmm. head, put your helmet on the inside part of this, mm -hmm. and that prevents that pass from happening. 
But it just goes to show, like, if all 11 guys do their job, this is a beautiful play. The problem is there was some sort of miscommunication here because I got to believe that Hart was supposed to stay with him. Yeah, I would say so. Yeah, I mean, we're not in the three deep, but maybe we should have been. I mean, that's the argument I'm going to make when it's fourth and 21. But anyway, he's a good 10 yards. He's he's 12 yards off. Yeah. So why are you 12 yards off covering the flat? I I, I can understand on fourth and 21, but if he's... I mean, he definitely sees this guy out of the backfield. and, And maybe he's sitting on that to make sure that... They don't give up the short pass and then a run to get the, which I guess I understand that. But then, you know, but 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 if, if you look at it, the the first down marker is the yellow line. Look where that yeah. is, and look where he is. So you don't need to tackle him here. Who gives a shit if we? It's fourth and twenty one. We're getting the ball back if you tackle him here or if you tackle him right here. Good point. The so is, I don't think it would have mattered if he was five yards further down. They still would have thrown it over his head. No, he still gives it up because he's flat footed. But, you know, how does that happen where he beat, you know? Yeah, that's... Mm. I mean, that just that just should not well, happen. Well, 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 the good news is, as my friend Mike Frank says, that's that's something that can be addressed in practice. Yes, that's 100%. That's something that competitions can hopefully burn out. That's... 100%. That, that, that's just a mental error. He didn't physically get beat. He just mentally... No. So, something you, blipped. I mean, and, I mean, you look where he's at. He's clearly not in the flats, even though he's no, looking and there. The, the, the linebacker on the hash has the the guy coming out of the backfield. So I, I, I guess I'm wondering what Hart thought he was going to be doing. Yeah, I got to believe that's a misassignment by Hart. Yeah. It's got to be. Yeah, um, but, you know, hey, I, I, I'm totally fine with having a nitpick on that. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. With the game. But it would have been nice to kind of finish that out. And, mm-hmm. yeah. You know, it is what it is. But, hey, um, we got to be excited for what we got. And um, Notre Dame did deliver on what they needed to deliver. They, mm-hmm. they came out and they showed some firepower. I think BYU will be the turning point in the season, quite honestly. I honestly believe if we can win that football game, there are a lot of good momentum generated going into the heart of the schedule, which is going to be – I mean, BYU starts the heart of the schedule, but if you get that win, mm-hmm. then I think the confidence level gets gets us right back to where we were after the Ohio State game. No, absolutely, I, and and I think you make an excellent point. You're you're getting into the the portion of the schedule that is, I mean, you've got Stanford and UNLV at home, neither of whom are really worried. Didn't Stanford just like lose their? Like, yeah, they lost their running back. Yeah, yeah he's so, out. So, so they're they're really going to have trouble, and you all, you all know these playing better than people thought, but I don't think they're necessarily going to stay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you got to go to Clemson. Clemson's been playing well, so you've got three very winnable games after BYU taking you into Clemson. If you go into Clemson with only two losses, who knows what's going to happen? Yeah, who knows? And and that's exact. That's the scenario you want. I mean, I think that's what we got to shoot for is hoping that we get to Clemson with two losses because then that game means a hell of a lot. And uh, I, I mean, look, we're not going to get back into the playoffs. I get that. That's no, fine. But, but you want to be knocking on the door. You want to just be in in that, you know, New Year's Bowl six conversation. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And who would have thought that was possible after the Marshall loss? Oh, absolutely. You know, absolutely. I mean, it yeah. just didn't even I, look possible. I mean, I, I'd, um, I'd love to be walking out of. I'd love to be sitting down after the Southern Cal game at ten and two, thinking, "Geez, can you imagine if we had just beat Marshall and all that?" But you know, yeah. that's. Those are good frustrations to have. Yeah. I think an, a ten and two or nine and three season after that Marshall game is going to be totally fine. Yeah, fantastic. And totally fine. Gonna, you, you've got a first year head coach. Yep. Uh, working with a young offensive coordinator, I think that yep. that's. And then go to a winnable bowl and win it. Yep. Which heck, how long has it been since Notre Dame did that? So yeah, I yeah, think, and I think nine and three is totally fine, totally acceptable. Totally kind of what we thought. We thought that, mm-hmm. yeah, worst case, nine and three, but a shot at 10 and two, mm-hmm. real outside shot, 11 and one, but more likely 10 and two, I think is what we all thought. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, 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 I like everything that I saw Saturday, gave everybody a big shot in the shoulder that, hey, this is this is a team that has some potential here. Yep. And uh, we just need to bring it home now. It'll be, it'll be interesting to see how that happens. Absolutely. Yep. All right, great. 
You've been listening to Dome and Domer, an online conversation about Notre Dame sports from a fan's perspective. For Mike Coffee, I'm Mike Brammer. Thanks for listening.